So let's kind of take a look at these best practices. Uh, one thing we're going to look at is the LAN side that encompasses, of course, the phone system and the local network and the wiring. We'll also take a look at the WAN side, uh, which is where really where the internet is, uh, internet providers, codec choices, and of course the internet, the voice carrier themselves. So let's take a look at uh, the local LAN. So first thing you need to do is you need to test all wiring in the office to ensure quality. Uh, make sure it's very simple to have somebody come in and just plug in and test the wiring and make sure that it's all up to code and that there's make sure making sure there's also no hubs or anything on the network broadcasting. Um, also, if, if possible, use pre-made wires uh, where possible. It's not always possible on a long uh, extension, but when you're doing short wire closet wiring, you know, buy those wires, take the human element out of it. Use newer managed switches, preferably with VLAN and PoE capabilities. Uh, PoE is power over Ethernet. A uh, benefit of that is really on the uptime perspective, on the reliability. If you have a power outage, it's much easier to put batteries and, and backup in a wiring closet than it is to put it out at every single phone that's plugged in with power. It's much easier to put that in the central facility. So there is a, a QoS component when it comes to power over Ethernet, and this really has to do with uptime. Um, on the VLAN side, it's good to build, to have switches that are capable of doing VLANs because then you can separate separate out your voice and your data into basically separate networks. And these separate networks, you can prioritize the voice over the data traffic. Uh, the benefit of this is that the even if you have an event like a, a virus or something happen on the data side, it, you'll keep it from affecting the voice side of your network. And for anybody out there who doesn't know what a VLAN is, a VLAN is basically a, a logical way uh, to set up separate networks. Instead of uh, setting up separate, completely separate wires or setting up two separate drops to every single workstation where you have a computer and a phone, uh, you can do basically the same thing by doing VLANs. It's a way on the switch of separating out this is a phone, this is voice, and this is data and separating that internally. Uh, it also helps cut out latency in the network by, by doing that. So also you want to use a SIP ALG firewall, uh, usually the one that's suggested by your SIP trunking provider. Uh, there's a lot of firewalls out there and they do a great job with data, but most of them do a very poor job uh, with voice over IP. Uh, so your, your SIP trunking provider should have a lab and they should have tested a few different uh, firewalls. Uh, example, we use the Ingate Separator, uh, which is a firewall, or we use the uh, Edgemark Edgewater which is a uh, T1 router that we utilize uh, uh, for our, um, our ALG. So we know that it works, um, but then it's a good idea for you to have your own firewall for your data, especially if you're, provided, if you're getting a, a carrier provided firewall. Uh, use a data firewall. You don't have to use an expensive one. It's really for what you would do on your network. Uh, a data firewall, the nice thing is that you can you can change your data firewall around all you want if it's separated and not affect the voice uh, the voice firewall because uh, you're really not going to want to change the voice firewall around very often but you might change your data one and the worst thing to happen is to make a change on the data side and all of a sudden come in the next day and the voice doesn't uh, the voice isn't working anymore you also want to set up a, a static IP address on the PBX uh, there, I've seen a lot of companies go out there and set their PBX to grab DHCP from their DHCP server, uh, grab a dynamic IP address, and uh, this can be a very bad thing. It makes it very hard to troubleshoot. It also, uh, there can be uh, route, call routing problems. Um, it doesn't have to be a public IP address, and I don't suggest putting a public IP address on a phone system, uh, but definitely don't use dynamic IP addressing. It's also, we talked about uh, public IP addresses versus private in the last, in the last line, but uh, choose a phone system that resides on a private IP address. It's much easier to secure. It's much more secure uh, to do that. Put it behind a, a, a gateway uh, that your carrier has access to. Um, you want them to be able to have a DMARC to be able to work, a DMARC, a line of demarcation that they can uh, troubleshoot and help you with. Uh, so VoIP appliance router like an edge marker and end gate that we use, uh, sit your, be able to sit your PBX behind that on a private IP address uh, so that's protected from toll fraud and so forth. Also, just remember, cheap phones typically have cheap call quality and reliability. Uh, get, uh, even if you're going to go out there and get an open source based PBX, they do a great job, but uh, don't skimp on the phones. The phones are 
are that point uh, where audio is changed from analog to digital. So it's really very important that that point is doing a very good job uh, in that conversion or you're going to be running around quite often trying to figure out voice quality problems. The next area to look at is the public internet connection and there's really a two schools of thought here doing public internet or doing private connections to a carrier. Uh, usually it's based on an MPLS based product but the idea is you'll have a carrier usually these are your larger carriers that say you can connect to us privately we you get a connection from us and it's private all the way you know you never hit the public internet that's usually the pitches that they'll make um, we just so you can probably hear from my tone that we're we typically go on the public internet side uh, we'll have some options soon for doing a private connection but uh, there are different reasons for a private connection a lot of them point to clarity and and really clarity is not the issue as you can see here and we've done the testing uh, typically we see a MOS score in the 4.0 to 4.4 range uh, somewhere in between that depending on the network setup uh, when it's on the public internet and on the private MPLS network we see a between a 4.2 to 4.4 while it's better on the private MPLS uh, you really the human ear isn't going to unless your major audio file isn't going to be able to tell the difference between the two um, on the reliability side it averages a little bit higher on the MPLS side uh, but they're still well within tolerances and industry standards to be on the public internet side but where it real the real big difference here is in resiliency when we kind of put together our strategy we felt that resiliency was a was a much more important piece because things happen that have nothing that they're completely outside of carrier control a lot of times the SLAs that are given don't include the last mile local loop so if uh, the underlying bell carrier that owns that last mile loop uh, comes in and shuts off the circuit by accident which is quite common uh, you want to have a, the ability to automatically fail over uh, to another circuit maybe that circuit isn't even from the same carrier or ideally it's not from the same carrier uh, usually a company that does private based connectivity will not give you the option to do that and and that alone is a is a huge hit in the reliability meter uh, consistency on both sides is good uh, a little bit better on the MPLS side simply because the environment is is so static uh, security is good on both uh, you have to pay more attention to security when you're on the public internet uh, but the private MPLS at some point you're probably going to share that for convergence sake and cost savings and and then you still have to think about security most security attacks happen because of poor passwording and poor policy and firewalling on the customer side it usually has nothing to do with the carrier side uh, flexibility uh, once again the public internet really uh, uh, pounces private connectivity and flexibility uh, being able to have circuits from multiple carriers, route calls all over the country, route caller ID, route 911, uh, those capabilities are really very flexible in the public internet side. And on the private side, they're really not. Uh, so if you're trying to do a centralization plan where you take a PBX at your headquarters, uh, like we talked about in our last segment, and then have different phone systems everywhere, uh, or sorry, just handsets all over the country, uh, all reporting back to your phone system, uh, that's going to usually be frowned upon or completely blocked by a private-based uh, carrier. And then on the uh, on the availability side, you're going to see a lot more availability on the public internet. Uh, I'll give you an example: we're in 317 markets today. Uh, most of the regional providers are in in at best in the low hundreds, uh, usually 100 100 or so. If you look at some of the other carriers, most of the CLEX are in the 35 to 65 market arena, and that that's going to be difficult if you have a bunch of locations. Also, things to note, so in public internet, you want to make sure you pay attention, special attention to traffic shaping and smart security practices, and you want to pay attention to the sizing of your IP circuit and the codec choice. Uh, from the private MPLS, you want to check and make sure that the carrier has alternate access and failover options. Uh, besides just failing over, taking your main number and forwarding it to a cell phone, uh, that's not really resilience. Resilience is being able to operate at your normal capacity, even in a failover scenario. Uh, also check if they have the ability to, to route caller ID and, call, and, and route uh, calls to multiple locations uh, even if that location is, is separate or a different location than when you're not, where your 911 is.